I am super excited to introduce you to our speaker today. He is driven by values and changing human perception on demographics. He is also the author of We Are All the Same Age Now and a great friend of IMEX. Please put your hands together for David Allison. Hey, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. And you know, the only weird thing about doing it digitally like this is that's the moment where I'm supposed to get some applause and I can't hear it, but I'm just imagining that there's applause happening for me right now. So thank you all for your applause. It made me feel very welcome. I am here to talk to you about secrets of human nature. Now, this is some stuff I've never shared before, stuff that's based on data that we've collected over the last five years. I'm going to show you how to boost the effectiveness of everything you do to try and get your target audience engaged and to influence the things you'd like them to do. We're going to share some really cool stuff today. So I will warn you, I'm a fast talker. There's lots of stuff. It's a good thing this is recorded. I would urge you to just sit back and relax and enjoy this a little bit. And let's just get started and see where we go. And there is a chance for questions, as they say, at about 25 minutes. So we'll, we'll get there and we'll see what you have to say. Two big objectives I wanna make sure we cover today. The first one is I'm gonna show you how to as much as 8X the effectiveness of every dollar an hour that you spend trying to talk to your target audience. 8X is huge and I'll back up that with data. And it's not a whole lot of work. It's just about changing the way you look at the world. And while we're doing it, what's even better is as corny as it sounds, we're also going to be able to change the world for the better. So those are the objectives for today. And I wanna start by telling you about the biggest mistake of my life and how I've now devoted the rest of my life to trying to correct this. And this mistake, I called it Bob and Sally, and here's how it goes. I used to have my own marketing and advertising firm and at the beginning of every single project that we worked on, we did a lot of high-end real estate developments like these towers you see here. At the beginning of every single project, we would be given a brief or we would make up a brief about who our customers were, who the prospects were that we were gonna try and sell these condos too. And they were always called something like Bob and Sally and they lived in the suburbs and they had a house with a white picket fence and they had 2.3 children and their son liked to go to soccer games on the weekend and their daughter liked to take piano lessons. And they sometimes even got into stuff about what kind of brands they like to wear, what kind of cars they like to drive. We had all this information that somebody had made up about Bob and Sally and we would take this as gospel and we'd run away and we'd go and spend a whole bunch of money, lots of money sometimes as much as a million dollars to try and get people to buy these condos in these high-end expensive condominium towers that we've been hired to help our clients with. Now, the interesting thing about the real estate development world from a marketing perspective is after you go and you blow all that cash trying to talk to Bob and Sally, about two years later, you get to go to the opening ceremony and see who's there, how many Bob and Sally's are in the room. And inevitably, there were very, very few Bob or Sally's in the room. There was lots of other people. We sold a lot of these condos, but where were the Bob and Sally's? Where were all those people that we'd spent all that money trying to talk to? And who were all these other people who showed up who we had no clue based on our description of our target audience, who they were? You know, it was the best we had. It was the best information that we had to work with. And so we did our best and we were successful, but we didn't know why it was working. And so I've devoted the rest of my life to that. Now we've all been looking for a much better way to understand our target audiences. It's not just me. And in fact, we're now at a point in history where we are drowning in audience data. We have data about how people click around on our websites and about how often they've been to our online stores and about whether they bought a ticket and how fast they bought a ticket and when did they download this thing and that thing and above. Oh, we have all this data about our audiences. But it really only boils down into two kinds of information. And that's it all that data collection we've been running around doing for the last 15 years, 20 years. There's demographic information and demographics is still really important. It will describe a target audience. It'll tell you what those people are in your target audience. And then there's psychographics and that's a big giant term that catches lots of different stuff. But the way I like to think about it is psychographics is anything about how a group of people, a target audience has behaved so far, how often they have bought something, how much of something they have bought when they plan on buying something again. We have demographics and we have psychographics and all this data we've been collecting fits into those two buckets. But what we really want to know how to do is influence people and neither demographics or psychographics do that. Influence, in fact, is what organizations are for. Every single organization on earth is here to do exactly the same thing. And that's to identify a group of people and convince them to do something. 
And when you think about it that simply, there isn't a single organization, a single enterprise on the planet that isn't here to do the same thing. Profit, not for profit, religious, governmental, it doesn't matter. We're all here to identify a group of people and convince them to do something. And yet we leave influence to guesswork and intuition. We collect the demographics, we collect the psychographics, and then we go, okay, well, if that's what we know about these people, then we think they'll probably respond to this. And that's the best we can do. We need to replace that guesswork and intuition though. We need a new kind of data that's specifically about helping us understand what will it take for this target audience to influence them to do the things we'd like them to do next. Now, behavioral science, which is a big umbrella term that encompasses a whole lot of different fields of scientific study, behavioral science has held the secret around this for decades. They've known about this. They've studied it six ways from Sunday at all the most prestigious universities all over the world. And very quickly, to just touch on a fast overview of a little bit of this, if you look at neuroscientists, neuroscientists will tell you that the prefrontal cortex of your brain, you've all heard this, the prefrontal cortex of your brain is like the CEO of your brain. And the CEO of your brain takes in all the incoming data and then bosses the rest of you around. Based on this piece of incoming data, you're going to feel this way. Based on this piece of incoming data, you're going to run in that direction or run towards something. Your prefrontal cortex is the boss. And your prefrontal cortex only does all of that deciding based on one set of filters, and that's your values. What you care about more than anything in the world, that's how your prefrontal cortex makes decisions about everything you do. And we move to psychology. Psychologists learn, it's a basic precept of, of psychology, that confirmation bias, this is a term they use, confirmation bias is something to be avoided in research because it's a natural, human, unavoidable tendency to run towards and agree with things that we already agree with, the things we value, the things we think are important. That's where we want to go. So when we're filling out a survey, if something sounds like something we already agree with, we're going to say yes to that, and it can really skew your research results. But what? If you did this in the reverse, if you turned that around and said, gee, if people are really, really unavoidably drawn to the things they already care about, what if we knew that in advance? What if we could be magnetic with that information? And then we go to sociology, which is where the research I've been working with for the last five years lives. Sociologists study masses of people. Why did this group of people do this thing and this people group of people do this other thing? It always comes down to the same thing, which is an analysis of what they value, what they care about. So what's key to take away here is that all these fields of human behavior agree, values determine everything we do. But here's the problem. We've never been able to isolate the shared values of an entire target audience before. So we've never been able to use what science has proven true as a way to motivate an entire target audience of people. Which ones do they have in common? So we went and built a tool that will allow us to do this. It's called the Value Graphics Database. Very quickly, here's a little bit about it. It's the first map of what everybody on earth cares about the most. We've done half a million surveys around the world in 152 different languages. We've measured all the values on the planet. We're accurate in 180 countries. What's interesting about this data is it's a random stratified statistically representative sample of the population and it's more accurate than you need for a PhD from Harvard. Now, it turns out there's only 56 values. There's only 56 things that people could possibly care enough about that they use to make all the decisions about their entire life. So that doesn't seem like it would be that difficult to figure out which ones a target audience have in common. Here's just a few sample ones, family, status, compassion, creativity, morality, happiness, balance. So the trick now that we can isolate for an audience which of these values they have in common is to figure out where that overlaps with what you've got. So what is it about what you've got and what they want? Where's that overlap? And now we can actually influence a target audience. There's three ways to find out what your most magnetic audience values might be. The first one, it's more accurate than a PhD. It's not for everybody though. It's to do a custom study with us. It costs some money because you don't need to be doing that. There's other ways to take care of this. There's an archetype quiz in my book which you can fill out just 10 quick questions and it gives you a scoring key. It'll show you which of the chapters in the book is most like your audience. But this is like playing the piano with your fists. At least you're on the right instrument. It may not be the most accurate thing in the world, but you're playing the right instrument. But here's the simplest and freest way to find out the values of your target audience. Just ask them the right questions. 
ask secondary questions. Never ask anybody what's on your mind. Ask them what you think other people are thinking about. What do they think the rest of your customers are all about? What do you think, what do they think the rest of the people that are in the group you're trying to understand might be thinking about? Because that gives people permission to give you truth because it's not me, I'm talking about those other folks. Now we're gonna have a quick bit of fun. I have this data from all over the world and we measured 56 core different values. Here's just some of my favorite ones. There's a bunch of values called the togetherness values, and you're going to see those in blue. Creativity, that's a value that shows up all over the world. Love, happiness, environmentalism. So mentally just choose one of these and watch what happens now. We're going to do a quick tour of the world and see which of these is most important in different regions all over the planet. So here's the data for the entire world, the 56 core values. You can see that cluster up at the top there of the togetherness values, creativity, roughly halfway down, then followed by love. One sort of on its own um, uh, togetherness value is always friendship, seems to be low in most places. Then there's happiness and then environmentalism down at the bottom. But if we compare this to Europe overall, Europeans, the creativity index is off the charts. You guys are an incredibly creative group of people, all my friends over there in Europe. And if we compare Europe to Canada, we can see that environmentalism is winning the, winning the race and pulling out ahead of the pack. If we go to the USA, I can see this and you probably can't. So I put a word there for us to uh, be able to focus on the number one most important value in the USA is belonging. That's one of our togetherness values, but it doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. So very unique to the United States, belongingness at the top. And we have friendship showing up right down in the middle for North American values, which is always an interesting place for it to be. All the other values way up at the top, friendship halfway down in the center. Now we go to China. In China, happiness is pulling ahead of the pack, but look at where love and environmentalism and creativity, it's much further down, but happiness, happiness is a big deal in China. We move to the rest of Asia without China, and we see that love has risen up. Love is gonna save the day for the rest of the folks in, in Asia without, with, once we take the data for China out of that particular data pool. In the Pacific and Oceania, we see a massive amount of creativity compared to the rest of the world. And in Africa, again, it's hard for you guys to see, but it's the only place in the world where community comes up way at the top of the list. So that's an interest. There's a whole PhD thesis in that piece of data alone. And in the Middle East, the only place on earth where morality is, on, is number two, right next to family at the very, very top of the list. We go to Central and South America and we see creativity and environmentalism almost neck and neck stuck in the middle. And if you remember all the other charts, which you probably don't because I've been whipping through them too fast. But if you look at that, that's a pretty interesting thing to have environmentalism and creativity right near the center, love, happiness, and some of the other togetherness values spread around as they, as they most more, more normally are. Whew, we just did a tour of the world, folks. We just did a tour of the world and what everybody on the planet cares about. As you can see, given the amount of time we have to go through this today, each one of those charts would be enough for us to spend an hour or two just dissecting why is it in this order and why do these people care about that more than those people? And then we can drill down to cities and then we can drill down to companies and then we can drill down to very specific brands. And what we do when we're working with a client and this is the download I've got for you today is a really quick worksheet we're going to go through now on values thinking. Values thinking is how you take the information that you've now collected about your target audience because you've just been asking them the right questions or maybe you've bought the book and you've done that 10 question quiz. You understand a little bit about what they care about, not just their demographics and psychographics, but what makes them human what they're worried about when they go to bed at night and what's the first thing on their mind when they wake up in the morning. So let's say you run a restaurant. That's what we're gonna pretend you're doing today because I know you're from all walks of life. You're all involved in various sectors and you're from all over the world. So we just pick something at random, we got restaurants. We're gonna do a speed session on values thinking. And again, please don't worry about how fast we're moving here. This is a downloadable worksheet for you so that you'll be able to study this and apply this principle around how to use values thinking to make better decisions inside your organizations after you've had a chance to read through that. So there's the address for getting it. It's valuegraphics.online backslash IMEX, valuegraphics.online 
backslash IMAX. There's a worksheet there for you, and there's a sample chart for restaurant patrons. Now remember, values thinking is really just about that overlapping Venn circle diagram we looked at a little earlier. We're trying to find out in your hypothetical restaurant chain that you own what you've got and how you can connect the dots to what your audience is looking for. So then you can start making decisions based on that place in the middle. That's what values thinking is all about. Values thinking has four very fast and easy steps. The first is what? And that's to ask yourself, what's the question? What are we trying to solve for here? What is it we're trying to make people do? Who is where you record the demographics and the psychographics that might be relevant? Don't worry about anything that's not relevant. As we mentioned at the beginning of our time together today, we're collecting far, far too much data about all kinds of things that don't really matter. Only put down stuff about who we're talking to if it is relevant somehow to the what, to the question that you're trying to answer. Then here's the piece we always miss. Why? Why do our target audience members make one decision versus another? That's where understanding their values, the thing that drives every decision in their life, that's where that piece comes into play. And then how? That's just a simple brainstorming exercise. Okay, if that's the question and that's who we're talking to and that's why they might make a decision we'd like them to make, then what are the ideas we can come up with? Then you know what to do from there. You pick one. You say to yourself, that's the one we're going to use. It makes the most sense. It ticks the what, the who, and the why boxes. Let's plan that. Let's launch that. Let's measure that. And then let's come back into this process and see if we can make it better for the next time now that we've collected some measurement data on how that tactic went. Let's do a really quick example. Here's that chart I promised you. This is the same 56 values that we were looking at for huge regions of the world. Here it is for people who go to restaurants frequently. Now, this is from a uh, keynote speech I gave to the Canadian Restaurant Association. So this is about Canadian restaurant frequent patrons. They have to have been going to a restaurant at least three times a week in a pre-COVID world. And what the question on the table for these folks is, how do we get them back? It's hard right now if you're in the restaurant business. Anybody out there who's working in restaurants or food and hospitality, you understand this. So this, I thought, it would be an interesting place to look. Now, of all the different values that we could be focused on, today we're just going to look at those top three. The three most important things to people who go to restaurants at least three times a week are belonging. They want to belong. They want to fit in. They don't want anything to be a big surprise. Personal growth. They want to be a better version of themselves tomorrow than they are today. And they want it to be an experience. They don't want to do something they've already done before. Or if they have, they want it to somehow be just a little different so that they have some kind of experiential hit that comes out of deciding to follow that particular uh, path and choose that particular restaurant, choose that particular activity. And you see all those other values there you could be playing with. We're just going to use those top three to keep this short and simple. So for belonging, let's say we know we're talking to restaurant patrons who come at least three times a week and they're in Canada. So that's our who. We know the question, the what is how do we get people to come back to restaurants? We would like them to start coming back again because restaurants need us. Uh, and so now we're, and that was the why, the values. We're going to go with belonging. We're going to go with personal growth. And we're going to go with, mm, what was the other one? I've already forgotten. Oh, forgotten. Oh my gosh. Uh, belonging, personal growth, and experiences. I'm glad we have a reverse button on this thing. Uh, so for belonging, nothing makes people feel like they belong more than being recognized. So what if you made it into a bit of a game with your staff? There's nothing earth shattering about this. I know this happens in all kinds of food and beverage and hospitality places all over the world, but flashcards, names, faces for your most regular customers so that everybody can be greeted by name, by everybody in the restaurant, whether it's their server, or it's the person who takes their coat at the door, or even the person on the phone recognizes them and says, oh, hi, Mr. Allison, it's nice to, I'm so happy to hear you're coming back. When can we have you, when can we expect you? So some way of making people feel more, uh, more belongingness as they decide to choose your particular establishment instead of someone else's. What's another thing we could do? Well, personal growth is something we know that's super important. These folks want to be a better version of themselves tomorrow than they are today. So how can we connect the dots, overlap those Venn circles between what you've got and what they're looking for? What they're looking for is some way to be a better person. Why would I choose your restaurant? 
maybe your menus need to be thought about as learning menus. Maybe there's something in there about depending on the kind of establishment you are, where these things are sourced from, something about the farmers, something about the nutrition value of the various ingredients, something about the way it's prepared, something about the chef in the back room, who, who is his grandmother's recipe. And then there's the recipe attached. So you can take that home and recreate this on your own. How can you build learning and growth into the offering? Because it's the second most important thing to people who come to restaurants at least three times a week. And then lastly, for experiences, I don't know, I'm, I don't run a restaurant. So, I mean, this is where, you know, this kind of sociological data needs a lot of inter interplay and interaction together. What if we had the kooky ingredient of the week? Uh, so every week you go in so that there is some kind of new experience at your particular restaurant. This week, we went to the store and we bought this weird thing. Uh, and we have no idea what this vegetable is, but we've looked it up. It's some sort of a vegetable from Thailand, and we're going to use it in a way like this. And we've done this with it. And we've done that with it. So there's always something new and interesting, even if it isn't a full-scale menu shift. So I'm recognized in there. I'm learning some new stuff, and I'm having a little bit of an experience. You have to tailor that for the particular establishment, for your brand, for the kind of customers you've got, of course. But to make the point... If you do those sorts of brainstorming exercises and you think about these kinds of things, instead of saying to yourselves, well, we would like more millennials and millennials, you know, avocado toast. That's what we need to be doing to get the millennials to come to our restaurant. That's what we need to stop. Demographics are no, in no way any indication of who people are. They're only a way for us to understand what people are. So we need to get to that point where we're understanding what people care about and using that as a way to drive our organizations forward and create that influence that we're looking for. Wow, that was the fastest I've ever talked. I took you on a tour of the world uh, and it's time to see if you guys have any questions um, because uh, that was a big barrage of information in a very short period of time. And in your book, you mentioned that people fall into a certain value or a profile. Um, it'd be interesting to hear from you what, you know, if you could explain one in more detail or what one you fall into. Oh, <laughs> so in, in my book right now, what we did is um, we took the top 10 most important value uh, archetypes, if you will, out of the data. The current book is about the Canada and the US data. The new book uh, at a date to be announced sometime in 2021, uh, will have the data for the entire planet. But for the Canada and the U.S. book, we have uh, 10 different archetypes. Now, remember, there's potentially hundreds of thousands of different profiles within the data set. But in order to have something to talk about, we just chose the top 10. Here's the 10 biggest, most aligned groups. Uh, and that's what the quiz is, is built on. So nobody is ever going to be one of those. You're all we're, Human beings are too complex for that. We're going to be a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but kind of, I guess, kind of like a zodiac sign. One will be dominant, and then you'll have some characteristics from this one and, and some characteristics from that. So personally, um, I have a lot of the loyalist lodge in me, and here's here's some stuff we know about people who have loyalty as a dominant, a dominant value in their lives. They tend to collect things, and you can't see because I have this lovely sheet behind me today. Um, but I collect art voraciously. Art, I collect art to the point where it's stuffed under the bed and I don't, it's stuffed under other people's beds. Like I have no idea how much art, it's not about where it goes, it's about having to own these brilliant ideas that are represented in two dimensions by other people. So collectors, because loyalty is really nothing more than, uh, a collecting is really nothing more than loyalty to a certain kind of thing. So anyone who's a collector tends to be a loyalist. They tend to like the same restaurant, the same chair, the same item on the menu. They wear their favorite pair of jeans is going to wear out. They're just going to go buy exactly the same pair of jeans and exactly the same size because why take a chance on something that I might not like? So uh, lots of interesting things about loyalists. Uh, and yeah, I definitely have a bunch of that in, in my own personal profile. But now this is turning into therapy for David. So <laughs> intent, but uh, <laughs> we'll have to have a glass of Cabernet one day and I'll tell you all about me. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. You, you may end up getting some inside knowledge from me there as well. Um, I'd like to, to move into a final question, if, if that's OK. And if we look at given how much companies have invested into, you know, demographic based data and so forth, do we really think that companies will change or do we have a part to play in ensuring that the companies do do change their thinking? 
All of the above is true. Um, and the first thing that I want everyone to understand is that we don't need to throw away any of the stuff that we've already done. I think about trying to understand our audience because remember the purpose of every organization is to identify a group of people and get them to do something. Yep. So to think about that audience as a the, what we need to know is a three-legged stool. You still need to know the demographics. So good for you, you've collected all of that information. Psychographics, past sales behavior, current sales behavior, you drink three cups of coffee a day, not four. That's a psychographic fact about you for somebody who's in the coffee business. But neither of those things tells us how we can maybe get you to drink more coffee or switch to Red Bull or start drinking tea or decide that um, caffeine is bad for you and stop it altogether. To do that, we need to understand what you care about. So we can say, you know what? You should stop drinking caffeine because family. And then we can tie that story back to yeah. the thing that you drive that drives your life. You need all three legs of this three-legged stool. You have to have them all. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And, and it makes sense to have that rounded view uh, for our audience to, to understand that it is, it is a, you know, still important to not lose sight of that as well. Um, David, I'd like to hand back to you now to, for your four-minute close to close the session. And I just want to thank you again. Uh, well, thank you, for, thank you for the good questions. I do want to close, and I purposely built this little um, moment in here just first, again, one more reminder, download that worksheet around uh, values thinking, you'll find it very useful. But I wanted to show you some data around something that's incredibly important that we've been talking about as a society and as a culture globally for a very, very long time. And because of these 500,000 surveys we've done now around the world, and we've measured what everybody cares about, there's something else that we've been able to discover and we can now put empirical data around. And it's sort of a favor I want to ask of you. And this is how we can all work together to make the world a better place. So within our 500,000 surveys from around the world, remember more accurate than you need for a PhD from Harvard, we can segment by demographics and say, how often do millennials agree with each other or women or people who earn $100,000 a year? Look at these numbers. Generation Z only agrees with each other on anything in life. 16% of the time, how can you target them as a group? How can that be a target audience based on what you think you know about Generation Z when they disagree with each other so frequently? Millennials only agree with each other 15% of the time. The trillions of dollars we have spent trying to make things and correct things and put policies in place and HR things for millennials, they disagree on everything 85% of the time. Boomers, men, women, your income bracket, whether you're married, you're single, what kind of a degree you have, whether you have kids or not, none of these are indicators of how similar you are to other people within that cohort. So when you describe your target audience as people of a certain age and a certain gender with a certain education level, you're putting a whole bunch of layers of people who don't agree with each other and don't resemble each other at all together into a much bigger group of people who don't agree with each other and don't resemble each other at all. And then you spend a million dollars. This is why Bob and Sally didn't show up at my building launches back in the day. But look at these numbers. If we put people in groups based on what they care about, now these are some of the groups in our data set. We give them cute little names because we're competing for people's attention like boomer, millennial. So we call ours different things based on what's most important to them. But look at how often they agree with each other. The creatives out there agree on everything in the world that it means to be human 82% of the time. That means the dollar you're spending talking to a value graphically defined group is at least eight times more powerful than the dollar you're spending talking to a demographically defined group. Moreover, our values bring us together. They create groups, they create audiences, they cre will create products for people based on what makes them human and what they care about, not on these divisive conversations about men versus women, rich versus poor, young versus old, married versus single. Everything in the world right now begins with division. No wonder we're in the state that we're in right now. So the question I have for you, the favor I wanna ask of you, the big close I wanna leave you with is please start using values to understand each other in your personal life, your professional life, Start using values to understand how to motivate your target audiences. It will as much as eight times improve the effectiveness of every dollar and hour you spend. More importantly, it'll help us change the world. It'll make the world a better place for everyone. So 
Here's the thing. If we want to change the world, clearly, the first step is we have to change the way we look at the world. And that's where I'll end. Thank you for your time today. Thank <laughs> you.